Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, especially after a long Fourth of July weekend. We really appreciate it. I'm Greg Polin. I direct the Southeast Asia program and the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative here at CSIS. And in case you came to the wrong link, this is the book launch of my forthcoming On Dangerous Ground, America's Century in the South China Sea. I say forthcoming because you can get it on Kindle. It published last Friday. Unfortunately, like everything else, submit our current world uh, publication of the hard copy has been delayed by a couple of weeks. But I promise they are going to ship in about two weeks. I, I am joined today by my very good friends and colleagues, Pete Martin with Bloomberg, who's going to help moderate discussion with myself and Bonnie Glazer, uh, who heads the Asia program at the German Marshall Foundation. But first, I'm going to talk about the book, and then I'm going to turn it over to Pete to help guide our discussion. Now, we do have a, a small audience uh, in our new hybrid studio here at CSIS and a much larger group online. I would encourage and, and welcome questions from both of you. Uh, Pete is going to be able to take them, whether they come in online or good old-fashioned raising of hands here in the room. Uh, and if you miss anything today, it'll all be up on YouTube and CSIS.org for perpetuity, I suppose. So with that, let me jump right into it. Why uh, write a book about the South China Sea in 2022? Uh, it's not as if we don't hear enough about the South China Sea for the last decade. And I suppose the answer to that is that I felt when I started this project at the end of 2018 that um, we really didn't have a general history of the South China Sea written from an American perspective for an American audience. Nor did we have one that very clearly laid out the history of the other claimants beyond the People's Republic of China. A lot of our historiography about the South China Sea ultimately derives from Chinese sources and Chinese academic writings from the 80s and 90s that have filtered down to the rest of us. And so the picture we have of the history of the South China Sea is skewed. Um, and then, of course, my job working at a think tank here in Washington is to advance the interests of the United States. And fundamentally, we had a, a question. What exactly are the interests of the United States in the South China Sea? There's been a lot of ink spilled over the last decade about whether or not the U.S. is losing the South China Sea or has lost the South China Sea. And the problem is that those terms are not usually defined. What exactly is it about a bunch of disputes over rocks and reefs half a world away that seem so darn important to multiple U.S. administrations. So I set out with those two missions. Let's tell the story of the South China Sea, and let's tell Americans why they should care in the first place. Uh, now, the disputes over the South China Sea, of course, are, are really twofold. We have a set of territorial disputes over the Spratly Islands, the Paracel Islands, uh, Pratas Reef and Scarborough Shoal, and then we have a set of maritime disputes, which you can see demarcated on, on the fancy green screen behind me via China's nine dash line. These are two different sets of disputes, and they involve different U.S. interests. The territorial disputes at this point are over a century old. And what often gets missed in the history, as we usually tell it, is that the U.S. has been there the whole time. The U.S. officials have been responding to um, developments and claims made over the rocks and islands of the South China Sea since the beginning of the 20th century. And that's because the U.S. started its relationship in the South China Sea as a resident power, as the colonial power of the Philippines. And so I had a great deal of concern in what I would refer to as the first phase of the disputes, pre-World War II, in the security of its colony, and particularly in Japanese advances in the South China Sea. The maritime disputes over water and seabed, those are newer. And I'll get to those down the line. But uh, one uh, message I want to drive home without eating too much into the Q&A that I know Pete wants to ask is, uh, what have the interests been of the United States over that century? Have they changed? Have they evolved? And w what I argue in the book, what I, what I came to through my research, is that, of course, they've evolved as the disputes have changed. But at their core, U.S. interests have remained pretty steady. U.S. involvement in the South China Sea has been reflective of much older uh, abiding U.S. interests, either in alliance commitments or in defense of maritime law overall, the idea of the oceans as a global maritime commons, which is about the oldest dispute or oldest interest you can find in U.S. foreign policy. Ever since the earliest days of the Republic as a trading nation, U.S. government uh, officials have stood very firmly on the idea of international maritime law, that the oceans are there for everybody. And so once the South China Sea began threatening each of those interests in turn, the U.S. responded accordingly and continues to. Those, those two things continue to be at the base of, of U.S. interests in the South China Sea. So uh, let's talk very quickly about how we got here. How did this South China Sea dispute 
or disputes come about in the first place. If we look at our map, we have two main island groups. We have the Paracel Islands up in the north, and we have the Spratly Islands down in the south. And I'm going to glance over Pratas and Scarborough for now, although I'm happy to talk about those in, in the Q&A if anybody's interested. The Paracel Islands dispute dates back to the 1920s in its current form. You had earlier annexations by the Wen Dynasty in Vietnam all the way back in 1816, and by the Qing Dynasty in China in 1909, but it wasn't until the 1920s that the French, the Japanese, and the then Republic of China all started making claims to this island group. Uh, down in the Spratlys, we had a somewhat later and messier uh, race to, to claim these islands. So nobody before the early 20th century had claimed the Spratly Islands. The Spratly Islands on pretty much every map of the world were just listed as the dangerous ground, a place to be avoided, a bunch of rocks and shoals and reefs that no sane mariner should try to sail through. Uh, only in the 1930s does that begin to shift we begin to get Japanese business interests moving into the islands, mining guano and phosphates and fish processing. And then we get an explicit claim from France. Paris becomes the first country to make what would be considered a modern claim to the Spratly Islands. Uh, they do so in first in 1930. They draw a box around a big chunk of the islands. They say everything in here is claimed on behalf of France. They do not claim a whole bunch of what we now think of as the Spratlys. So a huge expanse of these reefs and rocks, as we see them today, are outside of this original French claim. Because they're underwater, or they're very tiny, they remain part of the dangerous ground in the thinking of American and, and other foreign officials. In 1933, uh, pushed by objections from Britain and, the UK, or Britain and the US, who said, you can't just claim a box, you have to tell us what you're claiming, the French come up with seven islands. These are the seven islands that uh, Paris claimed, annexed in 1933, and that largely remain at the heart of the South China Sea dispute for decades after that, because they're all the biggest ones. They're the only place that any rational person would think is an island. If you get shipwrecked anywhere else in the Spratlys, you're gonna be up to your knees in water. So you better hope that you land on one of these seven. Up in the Paracels, uh, as World War II approaches, it becomes very clear that Japan is interested in more than just commercial enterprises. The French and the British start getting worried about this, as do the Americans from time to time, because the US has growing concerns about Japanese involvement in the South China Sea, encirclement of the uh, American Philippines. So in 1938, you have this race to occupy some of the islands, um, which had basically only been occupied to that point by fishermen and a handful of, of you know, meteorologists. The Japanese set up their first military bases on Woody Island and in Lincoln Island. The French go out, they try to do the same, they get there a little late, so they post up on Paddle, and they also drop their own people on Woody Island. Uh, in 1939, Japan annexes both the Paracels and the Spratlys as part of a single island group, which Tokyo calls the Shinangunto, the New South Southern Archipelago. It also sets up military bases down in the Spratlys on Ituaba. Uh, and that's kind of the story of the first uh, round of U.S. interest in the South China Sea. Throughout all of this, you have U.S. officials voicing increasing concern that Japanese claims to the uh, territories, the Paracels and Spratlys, are being made in some ways in contravention of international law at the time, but more importantly of ways, in ways that threaten direct U.S. interests in the Philippines, particularly U.S. navigational rights in the dangerous ground, the waters and, and reefs just off the Philippines. The 1930s also marks the first explicit statement of claim, uh, interest in claims, by Philippine officials, starting with Senator Elpidio Carino, who then becomes the Interior Secretary and will eventually be the President. So while much of the current historiography tells us that Philippine claims are relatively new, that prior to World War II it's really only the French by way of Vietnam and uh, the Republic of China making claims to the Spratlys and Paracels, that's just not true. That's a, a rewriting of the historical narrative. The US at this time looks into these claims that Philippine officials want to make and decides that the US has no claim of its own, that the islands cannot be considered part of the Philippines governed by the United States, but that doesn't mean the Philippines can't claim it for themselves after independence. Now, all of this, of course, becomes forgotten in World War II. There are much bigger concerns. After the war, we have a race to reoccupy the islands at a time when the U.S. and most others are distracted. 
You have the Cold War heating up. The war in Korea begins in 1950. The Chinese Civil War effectively ends in, in 1950 with the fall of Hainan. And throughout all of this, the claimants are making moves in the islands largely beyond the can of, of the outside powers. It starts in 1946 and 1947. As soon as the war is over, the French and the Republic of China race to be the first to reoccupy the islands. The Republic of China gets there first. It sets up military bases at Woody Island, the biggest of the Paracels here, and down in Ituaba again, which is the biggest of the Spratleys. Uh, but it has to leave those in 1950, as the last of the nationalist forces are evicted from Hainan. They can no longer keep the islands resupplied, so they hightail it out of there. The French do set up new bases in the Paracels, uh, which are then handed over to the client state of Vietnam and eventually the independent Republic of Vietnam based in Saigon. And they uh, end up occupying all of what we now call the Crescent Group of Islands, the half of, of the Paracels on the southwest. Um, I know the other one looks more like a crescent. I didn't name it, but that one's called the Amphitrite Group. In 1955, the People's Republic of China quietly moves into the old ROC base on Woody Island, uh, sets up shop, nobody seems to notice, and that presages the next, really, 30 years, 20 years, of divided occupation of the Paracels. Uh, French and Vietnamese on one half, Chinese on the other. Down in the Spratleys, uh, things are, are even more complicated. Again, the, the ROC had occupied Ituaba in 19. January 1947, but they leave in 1950 uh, once they get evicted from Hainan. Nobody occupies any of the Spratleys for a number of years until 1956 when a uh, famous Filipino businessman named Tomas Cloma, perhaps inspired by an infamous American adventurer named Morton Meads, I encourage you to read that chapter of the book, go down and they stake a claim to the Spratleys on behalf of the Philippine government. So Cloma says that he's claiming the, the Spratly Islands on behalf of uh, the Philippines as the province of Freedom Land. He gets no support from the Philippine government, but this does provoke anger among the other claimants, including the ROC, who comes back and reoccupies uh, Ituaba in 1956. That's the only occupation until the early 1970s. 1970 and 1971, the Philippine government under the Marcos administration finally goes out and sets up shop on six of these islands. Uh, formally claiming them for the first time, even though they've been talking about doing so for 40 years. And then uh, in response to the Republic of Vietnam in Saigon sets up shop on Namid Island. This is key to understanding what I would consider the second phase of U.S. interest in the South China Sea. Right? After the war, the U.S. is largely distracted. It's worried about Korea. It's worried about concluding the San Francisco Peace Conference, which left the sovereignty of these islands undetermined. It's worried about growing competition with the Soviets. And its number one priority in the region, other than eventually Vietnam, is maintaining this new alliance network that it's built. And when you look at the map of the Spratleys, you see that all three of the occupants are US treaty allies. Or, well, there's a treaty with the Philippines, there's a treaty with the ROC, and the Republic of Vietnam is an informal treaty ally. And so understandably, the biggest U.S. concern is keeping them from fighting. The U.S. has no interest in seeing these seemingly unimportant rocks and reefs provoke a conflict among U.S. allies, all of whom should have bigger things to worry about. And to their credit, the allies largely feel the same. The allies, while they jostle and they, they you know, play this game of checkers where they take one island and, and then another throughout the 60s and 70s, they are very careful to avoid conflict with each other. That only breaks in, in 75 or 74. And this presages the third phase of, of US interest, a much more dangerous phase for both the US and its allies. In 1974, the People's Republic of China decides that they are going to take the Vietnamese held half of the Paracel Islands, the Crescent Group. And in January, they provoke a fight, which they then win, the, the Battle of the Paracels. Much more about that in the book. But this leaves the PRC in control of all of the Paracel Islands for the first time. The U.S. response is, let's say, uh, found wanting. The U.S. does not believe its ally, the Republic of Vietnam, at first. It believes that somehow the Vietnamese must have provoked this fight because surely China cares more about its budding normalization of ties with the Nixon government at that time than it would the Paracels, which is exactly what China believed it could convince the U.S. and it worked like a charm. Uh, and really, the only U.S. concern is that an American gets captured in this. A former Green Beret, who's a member of the military assistance group in Saigon named Gerald Koch, 
is taken captive on Pabell Island along with the Vietnamese troops. And uh, Secretary or National Security Advisor and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and his team spend most of their energy after the battle just trying to get him released. This is a huge blow to U.S. credibility. The bigger blow, of course, comes less than a year later when Saigon falls. And so in this environment, you suddenly have uh, Saigon having fallen and the U.S. proving that it could be played by China up in the Paracels. You have, by 1979, the U.S. abrogation of its treaty with the Republic of China. And that's been clearly signaled for years, so everybody knows it's coming years in advance. And then you have the Philippines stuck out there as the last ally left in a fight uh, that it's not prepared for, in which by 74, there's real fear that the Chinese might come down to the Spratleys at any moment. And by 75, uh, with the taking of Saigon, all of the Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese outposts and Spratleys, are now held by North Vietnamese commandos. The Marcos government in the Philippines have very real reason to believe that they face imminent attack, including in one case, a defector from Vietnam who tells them that he had overheard North Vietnamese commandos saying they were going to invade the Philippine Islands. So for the next four years, you have a very heated discussion within the halls of government, Manila and Washington, about what exactly the U.S.-Philippine alliance means in this new, more dangerous era in which all the other allies are gone and the Philippines stands alone. And by 1979, the two sides come to a conclusion. They decide that the U.S. will extend the mutual defense treaty obligations under Article 5 of the treaty to any unprovoked attack on Filipino vessels, personnel, or, or planes anywhere in the Pacific, including places like Reed Bank, where the Filipinos are now beginning to explore for oil and gas by the late 1970s. It's not clear yet whether or not the islands are actually covered. The U.S. is very cagey about this because it worries that the Philippines might actually be the one to provoke a fight over the islands. But waters and airspace, that's covered. And that uh, remains the U.S. position effectively until 2019 when Secretary of State Mike Pompeo goes out to Manila and says, oh, the islands are also included. So from 1979 until 2019, we're in this very clear phase where the U.S. is committed quietly to defending Philippine interests, Philippine lives in the disputed waters of the South China Sea. And that becomes the, pr the primary U.S. interest in the disputes for years afterwards. The next um, phase of the disputes kind of breaks open in 1988. So this is when those fears about Chinese encroachment in the Spratlys finally come true. Um, much as they did in 1974, Chinese officials conclude that if they play their cards right and only pick on the Vietnamese, who are by that point still pariahs, they can get away with moving into the Spratlys, occupying these islands without provoking an international backlash. And they do, for the most part. China goes down and builds its first outpost in the Spratlys in January 1988 at Fiery Cross Reef. And this begins a race with the Vietnamese down there who try to take every island that's left before China can get there first. Uh, they go one for one for several months until uh, in April 1988, they both get to a certain reef at the same time. The Vietnamese land on Johnson Reef just a couple hours before Chinese forces get there. A uh, clash ensues in which the better armed Chinese Navy sinks all the Vietnamese boats on the scene and then turns their deck guns on the defenseless Vietnamese soldiers. That is the Battle of Johnson Reef. Um, after that, China has a free hand to occupy the rest of, of what it wanted. It ends up with six islands by the end of 1988. Um, having now shown twice that it's willing to use unprovoked force to take territory in the South China Sea. And uh, the U.S., as China predicted, does nothing. Um, the U.S. again believes the Vietnamese must have picked the fight, uh, and nobody's going to defend Vietnam uh, in 1988. Vietnam is without a friend in the world other than the, by that point, already uh, in turmoil Soviet Union. The same hubris and modernization that drove China to finally occupy the Spratly Islands in 1988 also leads China to begin to change the very nature of its claim. And that's what brings us into the current uh, state of, of the claims. Um, way back in the 1930s, Chinese cartographers had come up with this nine dash line. Just like it sounds, a bunch of dashes on some old maps, mostly British sailing charts, within which China said, we claim everything up there. Um, all the territory, all the islands. And that's because no Chinese official had ever set foot on them. So they didn't know what they were claiming. They just drew a line around it and said any rocks or islands you can find anywhere in this line belongs to China. 
And that is the basis of China's claims from the 1930s until at least the early 1990s. By the early 1990s, a new debate is taking place. It starts in Taipei, across the street, uh, the strait, and it eventually comes to Beijing about whether or not China should change the Nine Dash Line to not just be a claim to islands, but also a claim to all the water and seabed and airspace within it. And this eventually leads to, to China's claims of historic rights throughout the entire South China Sea. By 1992, China is claiming oil and gas rights at places like Wanan Bay down at Vanguard Bank. 800 plus miles from the Chinese coast, way beyond any legal claim uh, for many of the islands. It's uh, subsidizing fishing all the way down on the Sunda Shelf off Indonesia. By 1996, it draws baselines around the Paracel Islands and says everything inside the Paracels is now Chinese internal waters. Uh, no other foreign vessel or plane can pass through those baselines. All of this is clearly illegal in contravention of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which China helped negotiate which was signed in 1982 and finally took effect in 1994. Um, this provokes uh, the U.S. State Department to, in a sense, expand the nature of its interest in the South China Sea. Up to that point, the U.S. had only seen the South China Sea as a territorial dispute over rocks and islands that didn't directly affect U.S. interests as long as nobody attacked the Philippines. It was a matter of alliance credibility. But now suddenly, China is making these claims that directly infringe on the rights of U.S. ships, U.S. planes, U.S. Uh, citizens, and the threat to undermine the whole regime of international maritime law, which the U.S., as I said at the top, was deeply invested in. So in 1995, you get a statement from the U.S. State Department uh, when asked about Chinese occupation of an underwater reef, mischief reef. They say, quote, maintaining freedom of navigation is a fundamental interest of the United States. Unhindered navigation by all ships and aircraft in the South China Sea is essential for the peace and prosperity of the entire Asia-Pacific region, including the United States. The United States takes no position on the legal merits of the competing claims to sovereignty over the various islands, reefs, atolls, and caves in the South China Sea. The United States would, however, view with serious concern any maritime claim or restriction on maritime activity in the South China Sea that was not consistent with international law, including the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. That is the first official statement from a U.S. government agency that the South China Sea is not just about rocks and reefs anymore. For the U.S., it's about freedom of navigation, freedom of the seas, the rules-based order itself. And that has be been consistent now for almost 30 years. The U.S. continues to care very much about defending its allies, but just as much about defending the rules itself. Now, uh, all of this remained largely on the back burner throughout the 90s and 2000s until in 2009, China submitted the Nine Dash Line to the UN for the first time as a formal demarcation of its claims, kicking off what's now been more than a decade of steady escalation, increasing violence and coercion, the seizure of Scarborough Shoal from the Philippines in 2012, the start of island building in 2013, which led China to create three air and naval bases in the Spratleys where there had been none before, and now the steady tightening of the noose around all rights of all Southeast Asian claimants, as well as uh, external vessels and planes from the US, Australia, Canada, India, and so on, everywhere in the South China Sea. We're rapidly approaching a point at which the South China Sea will become a Chinese lake in peacetime. And with it, it's hard to see how, uh, when international law says that this is the extent of the claims, tiny bubbles around rocks and that's it, how can international law itself survive if China gets to claim 1,000 miles of water anyway, 1,000 miles of seabed anyway, just because it has bigger guns and bigger boats and is willing to use them? And I think I'm going to wrap up there rather than talking about what we are going to do about it, because I want to turn it over to Pete and actually have a conversation. Well, Thank fantastic. You. Yeah, thanks, Greg. That was uh, <clears throat> a really vivid uh, description of uh, what can be a pretty perplexing and complex set of issues. Um, before we open it up to audience questions, uh, I think I would be remiss if I didn't take the chance to pepper you both with a few questions of my own. Um, but for those watching at home, it would be great if you could submit questions uh, as we go along, and I'll do my best to get to as many as possible. Um, so to, to both of you, Greg and Bonnie, um, before we get into the specifics of the book, uh, I thought it would be good just to delve in for a second and, and you know, answer the question, why do we care about the South China Sea? Why does it matter to, to the US? Why does it matter to Americans? You want me to start or you want Greg to start? Why don't you go ahead, Greg? Okay. 
Okay, yeah, I didn't do enough talking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so as I said, the, you know, the U.S. has been pretty consistent in what its interests are. Now, how important those interests have been and how much the South China Sea has been central to those interests has obviously changed over the decades. Uh, the South China Sea went from being a strategic backwater in U.S. thinking to a major concern by, by the Obama administration, and that started in, in the 90s, where uh, today I think it's now really um, bound up in this larger questions about whether the international order, right? Do we live in a world in, in the 21st century in which rules apply to all, and we have these institutions and laws that govern the behavior of states, or do we live in a world, as China seems to want, in which, at least in Asia, there's a massive carve-out. The rules are whatever China says they are. The rules don't apply to China at all. Um, neither international law, as the U.S. knows it and has defended it for two and a half centuries, nor the oldest U.S. alliance in Asia, that to the Republic of the Philippines, could survive in that world. So everything else being equal, I don't see how any of the U.S.'s Indo-Pacific strategy and its interests survive if the South China Sea is, in a sense, lost to Beijing. Great. Plumy, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, i start by agreeing with Greg and telling all of our viewers what a terrific book this is, and everybody should read it. Uh, in addition to what uh, Greg has said about really underscoring the importance of the rules-based international order, um, it's the elements of that order that provide the rights of uh, access to resources of uh, uh, the, the, the maritime countries in Southeast Asia. And the United States, of course, uh, has always emphasized, as you said, freedom of navigation for military vessels. And we continue to conduct freedom of navigation uh, operations, FANOPs, around the region. Uh, but what's important is not only the freedom of navigation for military vessels, but the rights to oil and to fish of the, the countries that reside there. And China is, in fact, uh, intimidating countries, harassing them, uh, preventing them from accessing uh, those resources. I think commercial shipping is always uh, an important thing to cite as well. When I was here at CSIS and was director of the China Power Project, we did a deep dive into the, uh, into the value of uh, commercial shipping. I think that was about six, seven years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And we determined uh, that it was $3.4 trillion in uh, shipping uh, a year. Uh, probably hasn't changed uh, enormously uh, since then. Uh, now, of course, other straits could be used if China actually blocked commercial shipping just through w one or two of the straits. But if they actually tried to cut off access to the shipping in, in the entire area, then that, that would be, I think, really um, uh, threatening. Um, and I, I guess I'd say finally that it's, as Greg has, uh, has talked so eloquently about, it's an issue involving U.S. credibility. Um, that at times we have not been a reliable and credible ally. And for small countries in the region, if they feel that they have other countries, the United States being the most important, but I think also other outside powers that are willing to stand up for international law, that are willing to push back um, on uh, China's uh, threats to uh, the rules-based international order, then that means that they themselves are willing, perhaps, to stand up more for their own rights. Um, and if they do not, then we will see greater accommodation to Chinese um, interests uh, over time, and that will probably embolden China to push forward even further. Um, and we know that there are discussions in China about the possibility of drawing baselines in, uh, in the Spratleys, which, as Greg said, they drew around the Paracels in 1996. And that would be a huge, I think, uh, provocation that would really increase tensions in the region. And the U.S. has an interest in preventing that from happening. Great. Well, I'm going to get you to speak a little bit more, if that's okay, Bonnie. You, <laughs> you, you've worked for decades on Chinese foreign policy and on Asian security, both here at CSIS and now at the German Marshall Fund. And I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on Greg's book. What's new here? What's important? What should people pay attention to? Well, there are lots of things that are um, important. Some of them new, not all of them new, but definitely uh, underscored and uh, put in, I think, a, a broader context. And I think that the first, uh, my first takeaway is uh, 
that uh, China really has tested other countries. Uh, some of the claimants, we see uh, China, of course, testing Vietnam repeatedly, but also testing the United States. And when uh, these countries are tested, their responses then uh, provide lessons for China. Mm -hmm. uh, so we saw, for example, in May of 2014, when China uh, put a, uh, an oil rig inside of Vietnam's exclusive economic zone, and there was um, quite a pushback from uh, Vietnam with uh, fishing boats, ferries, vessels, and uh, uh, that, uh, that led China, we believe, to withdraw that oil rig early. And I think that was an example of unsuccessful coercion uh, by China. And then, of course, there's the broader um, response of the United States as China began dredging, building these islands, and then militarizing them. And that, of course, began in uh, December of 2013 on a very small scale, uh, but the United States did not respond. And the lack of that response, I think, led China to believe it was pushing on an open door. Mm. Um, and of course then ended up uh, dredging three very large islands um, and building those out into military bases. And uh, the lesson there, uh, of course, is um, if uh, China sees that it can get away with militarizing the South China Sea, even though Xi Jinping stood alongside President Obama in the Rose Garden and said that he had no intent to militarize the South China Sea, that it will do so. And. Uh, we saw, um, I forget exactly what the date was, Greg will remember, but uh, the head of China's, then head of China's Navy, Wu Sheng Li, basically told his counterpart, we expected a stronger response, uh, but it didn't happen. So, you know, we, we continued. And, and so I think that's really an important lesson. Um, secondly, I think, um, you know, Greg has talked a great deal about the importance of our alliance with the Philippines, and that is a theme throughout the book. And it really is a, a great case study in the dynamics of alliances, of fear of entrapment and fear of abandonment, where the United States was afraid it would get dragged into a conflict and the Philippines has been fearful that it would be um, abandoned and how the U.S. position has evolved over time. And it is only, as Greg said, in the Trump administration that we have said um, that uh, the, the issue of, uh, of um, of whether or not the uh, disputed islands in uh, the South China Sea was actually covered by the Mutual Defense Treaty. And that statement now, I think, is really an important uh, deterrent uh, to, to China. And we see just even today what is taking place on Second Thomas Shoal, uh, which Greg provides great details in the book, where the Philippines beached an old, rusted out U.S. Navy ship years ago, remains, I think, one of the major flashpoints. And it is the importance of the alliance and the credibility of U.S. commitments that I hope um, will prevent that from becoming uh, a, a, an area where we could see China's uh, use of force. And then finally, uh, this is a really important takeaway, I think, is that Greg emphasizes the limits of using military tools alone. Mm -hmm. And again, FANOPS necessary, um, uh, essential, but just not sufficient. And how we really need to combine the economic tools, the diplomatic tools, along with, um, with military tools. We have to integrate them more successfully in order to strengthen our relationships in the region and to bolster deterrence. Terrific. Um, Question for both of you. Um, Greg, in the book, you talk about the ways in which uh, Beijing tried to test the Obama administration in the early years um, of, of President Obama's presidency. Do you see a similar pattern playing out now in the Biden administration? How would you characterize Beijing's behavior, um, and how has the administration's policy held up? So I'm, um, I actually am a bit on the fence uh, about this narrative that Beijing tends to intentionally provoke crises at the start of every new administration, mm. to test new administration. What I, what I think perhaps a better way to think about this is that Beijing often operates as a roulette player, putting down small bets across the board and sees which ones pay off. And so a new administration almost inevitably walks into a crisis sooner or later with China because that's the way China has set up the board. I think that we're certainly seeing that um, now with the Biden administration, um, and, and uh, you know whether it's on economics or Taiwan or the 
Indian border or harassment of Second Thomas Shoal, where the Chinese have blockaded resupply of Filipino troops now, um, I think twice in just the last year. Uh, the other thing that comes into play here is, as President Obama had to deal with in the second term, Xi Jinping is a much more risk tolerant leader than his predecessors have been, at least since, since Deng Xiaoping's elevation. Um, and so the willingness to reach for coercion rather than other tools is much higher from China. And I do think that the sentiment, at least in, in Zhongnanhai, in, in, in the you know, presence offices in Beijing, remains that the US and the West are in terminal decline and that China's rise is inevitable. And therefore, China should keep pushing because eventually the US will not push back. Sorry, Bonnie, do you have any thoughts on that before we move on? Let's go on to another question. All right. Well, just finally from me, before we, we open things up more broadly, um, Greg, you, you begin and end the book with this fascinating question of whether the US has lost the, the South China Sea. Um, and, and, and you know, you lay out three scenarios for, for the way forward. I wonder if you could elaborate on your thoughts on that question a little bit and, and you know, come back to this central problem of whether it's lost the South China Sea. Right, so I'm, while the book is basically a, a history, um, I'm not a paid historian, right? <laughs> I'm a think tanker, my job is to provide advice, um, hopefully for US policymakers, um, whether or not they wanna take it. And so uh, the fundamental question, book ending the book, is wh what do we care about here and how do we achieve those ends? Um, if, as, as I argue in the book, the US most abiding interests remain defense of the alliance with the Philippines and defense of freedom of the seas, the rules-based order, then clearly we are losing, um, although I don't think we've lost. Since the completion of its island bases, the artificial island bases in the Spratleys, China now has considerable overmatch with the US locally. It dominates the air, the sea, the electromagnetic spectrum. Its coercion has made it all but impossible for US allies and partners to undertake any peaceful activity, uh, whether it's fishing oil and gas exploration, law enforcement patrols, et cetera. So we're, we're getting dangerously close to the point at which freedom of navigation no longer exists in the South China Sea, at least for anybody except the US Navy. And if the US Navy is the only one that can sail the South China Sea, then we've already lost. Um, so how do we, well, that's the glide path we're on. That's, that's future one, a, a steady diminution of, of rights and rules until eventually the US Philippine Alliance breaks and unclose breaks, at least as applied to the South China Sea. And that's not a very good future for US interests or those of our allies and partners. Um, option two would be in that trying to confront that, the US and China end up in a conflict which neither wants and which would cost far more than a gain to either side. And so option three, the one we want, is, is as Bonnie indicated, a combination of the US military deterrence, shoring up the alliance with the Philippines to deter China from military force while buying time for a long-term international coalition to impose diplomatic and economic costs, convince Beijing that its behavior in the region undermines its global goals of leadership, and perhaps China will reach for compromise instead of coercion. I kind of do want to know the answer to whether you think the US has lost the South China Sea, Bonnie. I'm happy to tell you. <laughs> well, we certainly cannot restore the status quo ante to sort of pre-2014 um, and, and before China really started uh, dredging, building the islands and, and militarizing the South China Sea. I'm less pessimistic, I think, than Greg is because mm. uh, we can tick off the many countries that cruise through uh, the South China Sea um, conducting their own ways of uh, enforcing uh, their freedom of navigation. There's there's France, uh, the UK, we had a German ship uh, out there last year, a frigate. Um, and then, of course, in addition to that, there's Japan and Australia, uh, Canada, um, I think India. I'm not sure if I've left off some, but all of those certainly um, in addition uh, to the United States. And even when faced with uh, very dangerous harassment by China, we, we saw just a few weeks ago an episode in which a uh, Chinese fighter jet intercepted an Australian P-3 surveillance plane, um, very dangerously flying in front of it, uh, very close, and then 
releasing uh, apparently flares and chaff that went into the engine. Um, I, I think you will not find that Australia is going to decide to stop conducting its, uh, its operations there. Um, so uh, flying aircraft as well as, of course, sailing Navy ships. We have a number of countries that will continue to do that. So I don't think we're really at risk of sort of losing um, freedom of navigation at this point. I'm more worried about smaller countries in the region deciding that it's, it's pointless um, to keep standing up to China and eventually they concede some rights. Uh, there was some discussion over the last few years about the possibility of joint development uh, between uh, China and uh, the Philippines. That has only recently been declared by the government in Manila at the end of those discussions or negotiations, but now we have a new government uh, in Manila under Marcos, so we will have to see whether that comes up uh, again. But I think uh, that I, I'm concerned about countries basically thinking that if they compromise with China, maybe they will be able to get something um, that they cannot do today, which is maybe you know drill for oil or drill for gas in these uh, areas that are um, that are that are disputed. So um, I, I, I think um, what we can do uh, is be a better partner, a better ally, provide uh, maritime capacity building as we already are, but uh, also provide uh, economic um, uh, support. And uh, we, this is the area where I think that the Biden administration hasn't done the best job. And uh, when the Trump administration pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, it really didn't do anything to provide an alternative. The Biden administration has now provided um, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. We will have to see, I mean, the jury is still out as to whether or not that will be a really significant uh, kind of, of mechanism. Uh, but of course, countries in the region really want the U.S. to be more involved uh, economically and provide more uh, development assistance as, you know, the, the Chinese through their Belt and Road Initiative still uh, uh, are, are, are seen as probably the, the top provider and most reliable uh, provider of, of, of aid. So the very last comment that I'd like to make, which is actually going to be a question for Greg, if mm. that's okay, is one thing that you don't state in the book is what might be the utility of having Taiwan, uh, the government in Taipei, make uh, public the origins of the nine dash line because after all they created it as the uh, 11 dash line and Greg uh, made the point earlier that essentially it, I, it was I, I think you made this earlier but you made it in the book about how it's a sent it was essentially a claim uh, to the land features not uh, not the water and this has now evolved um, uh, through the uh, role played by some Taiwanese uh, scholar who <laughs> went to mainland China and, and ultimately, I think, convinced the government there to evolve this position of historic rights. So as the creator, w would it make a difference um, if Taiwan were to actually release all of its archives? They've released some of them, but they have apparently held uh, some back. This discussion took place between the U.S. and Taiwan during the um, Ma Jiao administration. Uh, but of course now the increase in tensions across the strait I think has led the United States to believe this is not an issue we should, we should address now. We should just put it on the shelf. So is this something that you think if we set aside the issue of the friction and, and between the two sides of the strait, would it make a difference? How would China respond? Um, so th th you're right. I in particular the last chapter, I don't kind of provide a roadmap for what Taiwan's role is here. I, mm -hmm. I talk about what everybody else's role is. Um, you know, the Ma government, the Mayan Zhou government, um, as previous KMT governments had done, really pushed um, the South China Sea as uh, kind of a political, a domestic political cudgel, um, right? That they were the ones who were tough and standing up for sovereignty and, and the fact that their claims happened to, to therefore be supporting China's claims was um, you know, fine, and you know the Ma government flew me out once to Ituaba um, in order to try to use me um, along with a, a few other um, foreigners as kind of props to to talk about how Ituaba is a real island and deserves full entitlement and all of this. Which I, when I told them I wouldn't do the press conference afterward, they said, okay, you don't have to do any interviews at all then. Um, 
but since then, the Psy government's been quite quiet. And so I, I, I think it would help on the margins, right? It would help shore up international support if it's used right. Mm -hmm. if, if you're able to kind of counter this false PRC historiography that's really taken over the debate for the last 30 years. Um, it would help counter disinformation in the Philippines and Malaysia and Indonesia where you often hear local scholars basically repeating Chinese talking points, uh, you know, doing China's work mm -hmm. for them because all of the sources they have access to are ultimately derived from China. I don't think it will actually change anything in Beijing, though I don't think Beijing cares what any of us have to say about its claims. I don't think that China cares whether or not the Nine Dash Line actually means what it says it means, right? This is what it means now. Um, and history for the Chinese government is plastic and can be changed and molded as necessary, um, as any good Communist Party knows. All right, well, on that note, I'm going to open it up to audience Q&A. We have a hybrid audience here today, so a few people here in the room, and then we already have some great questions coming in from online. Um, in the interest of getting through as many as possible, I'm going to ask panelists and uh, those asking questions to keep them as short as we can. And I'll give the opportunity now for anyone in the room who wants to ask a question, um, please raise your hand and identify yourself before you do so. Otherwise, I can go into uh, some of the online questions we have. All right, they're feeling shy in the room. So I'm going to go into a question from, uh, from Angie Chen at the Central News Agency. And she asks whether the US's strategy to deal with relations with the Philippines is going to change in the South China Sea. Um, and you know, will the US-Philippine relationship change in the light of the inauguration of the uh, Marcos administration? I think that we're going to see a continuation of the deepening of the alliance that's occurred over the last year. So the, the, the alliance went through some rough times under the Duterte and Trump governments. And since Secretary Austin went to Manila last year and then Secretary Lawrence and his counterpart came to Washington last summer, we've had remarkable progress. The Visiting Forces Agreement, which allows the U.S. Uh, troops rotation to the Philippines, has been maintained, deepened. We've announced that we're going to be uh, finally implementing the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, which was negotiated in 2014 to allow U.S. troops to build up Philippine military facilities, rotate through them, and then eventually hand them over to the Philippines. And we've done a bunch of other things, new defense guidelines, new maritime security dialogue. I mean, all of this represents the maturing of the alliance in a way that's long overdue. All other U.S. alliances, be it NATO, Japan, the ROC, the Australia alliance, have all evolved. Uh, since their birth in the Cold War to you know, become ready fit for the 21st century. And the Philippine alliance has really been stuck uh, where we left it at the end of the Cold War. So this is all necessary. I think the Marcus administration, at least from, from what we can tell from public uh, remarks, remains committed to that process. And they're going to let the Philippine bureaucracy and military do what they want to do, which is deepen the alliance with the Americans. Got it. Bonnie, you have any thoughts on that before we move on? I would just add that um, I would hope that the Marcos administration has learned some lessons from uh, the last five years of uh, the Duterte administration regarding uh, their strategy of putting the ruling on the shelf and uh, trying to, uh, to work uh, closely with, with China. I, th I think that strategy really didn't deliver. Uh, it did not really serve the Philippines' interests. I think the Chinese did not provide uh, perhaps what they had promised. Um, and uh, if the Marcos administration learned some lessons from that, in addition to building on what all of these uh, developments that Greg has laid out, then I think that the prospects are, look really quite good for, uh, for the U.S.-Philippines relationship. And we'll have to see whether uh, the, the Chinese, how, how they play their cards, you know, are they going to um, use which, which carrots, which sticks. Um, uh, but I think that uh, some of what has transpired has really run its course in, in how, for example, the uh, China uh, ASEAN discussion on the code of conduct, which I think probably most, if not all, of at least the claimants uh, would probably say uh, that that has not uh, produced anything and is not likely to, although I think few would want to completely abandon it. So I, I, I think from the Philippines' perspective, the best uh, way forward to protect its interest is in a closer relationship with the United States. 
Great. Well, we have a, a really interesting question here from Shan at Voice of America, um, who says that the, the Maritime Counterinsurgency Project just started this month, and its project director argues that the U.S. should recognize China's contest as an insurgency against the rules-based order. What do you think that a U.S. maritime counterinsurgency strategy in the South China Sea would look like? And I guess I'll just tack on myself there. If, if that's not the right framing, what is? And you know, is it, is it a military first strategy or is it something broader than that that's applicable? So the, the counterinsurgency project that, that's being referenced is a new program at the U.S. Naval War College, um, which is being run by, by Hunter Stiers, a, a friend who will also be speaking later this month at the annual CSIS South China Sea Conference. I don't want to speak on behalf of Hunter, his team, or try to, um, you know, interpret their, their analysis and their strategy. And while they launched a bunch of articles in their initial trench last week, I haven't gotten to read all of them. So, uh, what I will say is, so I mentioned that the future strategy for the U.S. really has to focus on combining short-term military, military deterrence with, with a long-term diplomatic and, and economic strategy. I don't believe that there are military solutions to the South China Sea. Mm. Um, no, you know, any military conflict would, would you know, n clearly not be worth it and not be in the interest of any of the parties. Uh, however, we have a dangerous gap right now between say and do. We have you know, Mike Pompeo stood on a tarmac in 2019 and pledged that the U.S. would defend any Philippine troops, vessels, or aircraft that are attacked anywhere in the South China Sea. And yet, as I said, China controls the air and the sea and the electromagnetic spectrum of the South China Sea. And the closest U.S. military bases of any capability are in Okinawa and Guam at distances of 13 and 1,500 nautical miles. Uh, the only thing the U.S. is going to do is help with search and rescue operations if China decides to rip Philippine troops off of Second Thomas Shoal or something. So getting EDCA, the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, implemented, getting U.S. forces rotating through Philippine bases, getting them training with their Filipino counterparts, and in particular, getting them using land-based fires, giving up on the idea that we're ever going to be able to contest Chinese control at sea within the South China Sea, and recognizing that our only advantage is that we have an alliance network that is better positioned than China's, that the Philippines is closer to all these disputed areas than China is, Japan is closer to the Senkakus and so on. Um, and you know, the U.S. Marines get it. That's why their concepts around standing forces and the expeditionary advanced basin operations are all about getting forces within China's range rings, you know, and with land-based fires and the like in advance. The Japanese get it. Um, and the Philippines is beginning to get it. That's the only way I see to change this pretty brutal math in which China's made all the right investments and we've made all the wrong ones for 20 years. Bonnie, you have anything to add there on I think that approaches? there is a risk in defining the uh, U.S. strategy and goals in the South China Sea as in, in exclusively anti-China mm. um, ways. I think that that, that frame um, has a tendency, at least in some capitals um, in the region and, and even beyond, um, as uh, being seen as uh, putting them in the awkward position, as you know, Southeast Asians like to say, being forced to choose between the United States and China. So they want to see U.S. pushback, absolutely, but I think they don't want U.S. strategy to be framed that way publicly. And so I think putting out positive visions um, for the region generally is more effective in building coalitions. So we want to build more coalitions, um, and, but not call them certainly anti-China coalitions. Uh, the Quad is not an anti-China coalition. AUKUS is not an anti-China coalition. Uh, but both of those are being framed in more positive ways. And I think that's one of the reasons um, why, although initially, for example, um, many of the uh, members of ASEAN were concerned uh, about the Quad, I think they're less concerned today because of what the Quad um, has done, its actions, and the way that it defines its, uh, its purpose. So to me, counterinsurgency is something that we have to do, but I'm not sure we should frame our strategy around that, um, around that specific goal. Terrific. Well, we have a question here from James Dennis, who is a, a maritime, a marine policy analyst, um, and he asks, "Why has the U.S. Senate not ratified UNCLOS?" And I guess I would tack onto that, 
what are the prospects for that actually happening? Uh, plenty of this in the book. Um, you know, the U.S. was there. The U.S. gave as good as it got. Unclose is as much a product of U.S. negotiation as, as anybody. Um, then the U.S. under the Reagan administration walked away largely because the Reagan administration decided that the revenue sharing schemes on the deep seabed mining chapters, which were the hardest part to negotiate, that they smacked of socialism. Right? It was a purely ideological opposition. Ironically, we then spent 10 years negotiating an addendum. We had an implementing agreement signed in 1994 by the Clinton administration that is effectively a, um, you know, important series of amendments to UNCLOS, even though we don't call them that because the treaty was supposed to be take or leave it. So we got our way, you know, we, we took our ball and we went home until they gave us what we wanted, and then we still didn't ratify the thing. The last time there was any real effort, um, I mean, it failed to get to the floor when the George Bush administration tried to bring it. Uh, John Kerry, when he was head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, organized a series of hearings, bipartisan, in which basically everyone under the sun came before the Senate. Uh, admirals, members of Greenpeace and Chevron sitting side by side, everybody arguing that uh, ratification was clearly in the U.S. national interest. They could only find one, uh, the Republican opposition could only find one person to testify against it. Um, and it was a, 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 I'd call him ideological opponent over at Heritage. Uh, but then it fell victim to election year uh, uh, politicking in 2012 and, and they lost just enough Republicans that couldn't get done. Today, I mean, I've run the math, a little bit of it's in the book, although I don't really name them any names, but the fact is that of all the Republicans who were going to support it in 2012, only three of them are left. All the others have lost their seats, they're retired, and been replaced by more ideological uh, replacements. So I, I don't see any future. You would need a significant Democratic supermajority to ratify anything with the word United Nations on it, given the current state of the Republican Party. Well, that means your assessment the same. Not optimistic. Um, I think that uh, there was this moment when President Obama said, I think it was in a speech at the National Defense University, that this would be a priority. The U.S. would seek to ratify UNCLOS, but then, you know, it really wasn't followed up with the necessary action. And you know, we were we were doing health care. Obamacare was the top priority for uh, for the president, and understandably so. But they ran out of time. Um, there's only so much that any administration can achieve, even when it has uh, its own party in the in the majority. So, if they had the votes then, that would have been uh, an an opportunity, and is is looking back certainly a missed opportunity. Um, uh, one other point that I'd like to make that Greg uh, discusses very clearly in the book is it's not only the United States that was deeply involved in these negotiations, but China was too. So there may be parts of the international order when China says it was negotiated, we, uh, but we were not, not part of it. Uh, uh, but when it comes to unclose, uh, China was um, you know, almost from the beginning, and certainly in the phase of the negotiations that were really consequential, was very deeply engaged. And uh, China, uh, China's views were, were considered uh, taken into account and in some ways uh, factored in. And so that actually, I mean, should really make it, uh, make, make it easier. I think it should have been ratified, not, of course, just by China, but by the United States. So what we face today is that China is a signatory of uh, UNCLOS, and it does not abide by it. The United States abides by the Convention on the Law of the Sea and is not a signatory. And that is not an American interest. Well, on that paradoxical note, uh, we've run out of time, but uh, I'd like to close by thanking Greg and thanking Bonnie, uh, everyone here today and watching online for their participation. Uh, it's been a great discussion, very enriching, uh, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Pete. Thanks.